let me introduce our presenters for our opening essay. Daniel Ababa is the Vice Provost of the University of Chicago and the Harold J. and Marion F. Green Professor of Law and Walter Manzer Teaching Scholar at the University of Chicago Law School. Adam Chilton is Professor of Law and Walter Manzer Research Scholar at the University of Chicago Law School. And Tom Ginsburg is the Leo Spitz Professor of International Law, Ludwig and Hilda Wolf Research Scholar and Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago Law School. With that, I turn the floor over to the first presenters. Thank you very much, uh, Jared and Nima for, and everyone at the Siegel staff for putting this together. And thanks also to the extraordinary set of scholars who've uh, chosen to uh, respond to the, the call to participate. It's really a wonderful and very global group. So we're really excited to hear what folks have to say today. Um, so uh, the way we're gonna present our first uh, paper is I'll start and then pass it off to Professor Chilton and then to Professor Ababa will each talk for just a few minutes. Um, and I suppose the motivation within the paper is to look back at something that international lawyers have done periodically. We started in 1906, but then focus quite a bit on a 1999 symposium in the American Journal of International Law in which uh, seven different methods were chosen, methods of international law, to analyze a particular problem. And those were, you know, uh, pretty well known to international lawyers at the time, the New Haven School, Critical Legal Studies, on economics was included, et cetera. Um, and the basic setup there was that these methods would be each asked to analyze a particular problem. And that would expose the sort of pluses and minuses of the method um, and in something of a, a horse race, you might say. Now, um, we started by sort of observing that just as this race among methods was going on, many of the labels <laughs> Um, that were set out there. Some of them disappeared, some of them, you know, expanded. But um, what's really happened is that there's been an explosion of what we're calling social science work. And I think that's appropriate, partly because I think that you can never really get to an ought from an is, uh, is something that uh, uh, philosophers tell us. But it is also the case that if you do have an ought, it should be based on what's possible. And that is we should, in thinking about our normative commitments to international law, think about what's feasible. And of course, this moment of 1999 was a critical one for international law. Um, shortly thereafter, we saw you know, the September 11th attacks, a kind of um, uh, uh, sort of turn away from open globalization, perhaps, to more emphasis on security. The big point of our essay is that to understand these developments, one should take a social science approach. And we're not particularly interested in the labels, or, and we're also not particularly interested in fights within social science among the best way to do it. Um, we have a very big tent view of what social science is, but basically any approach that is taking um, a rigorous approach to identifying a research question, laying out a hypothesis, and then specifying some kind of relationship among variables which would verify or reject that hypothesis is within the gamut of what we would call social science. Um, and we've just seen an explosion of this kind of work. Um, so we wanted to consolidate that view with the essay. I would argue that some of the other schools of international law around these days are also sort of dependent in part on is statements about the world. Um, I think of the Twale School, and we're honored to have Professor James Gotti, who, who is one of the founders of that school, you know, basically making a claim, which he will describe, I'm sure, better than me if he chooses, but that, um, you know, the third world has been left out of international law, and that um, this is something that can be demonstrated historically, and that those effects have, that those, those historical factors have lingering effects. Well, that's, at bottom, an empirical claim that can be assessed with data and, and addressed with historical research. So at the end of the day, we're not so much focused on labels. We're calling on a consolidation and an extension of this kind of work, asking about what is to inform our projects about what ought to be. And with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Chilton to stand. So Tom, uh, Daniel, and I, all three of us have a background in political science as well as uh, in law and you know, joint degrees in these subjects. And at least when I was in graduate school and breaking into this, 
In international relations and in political science, you spend a lot of time learning about different schools. So you're told about what the realists think and what the institutionalists think and what the liberal uh, constructivist school thinks, whatever it is. Uh, and there was these um, periods of great debates between uh, scholars, should we be realists and what are the assumptions associated with that, et cetera. Um, this is slightly oversimplifying, but if you now wanted to go into international relations, you might have to learn these classes in the graduate seminars that you, these ideas in the graduate seminars that you take. Uh, but you don't really have to spend any time figuring out whether or not you're a realist or a constructivist or anything else. You figure out what you're substantively interested in researching. I don't know, compliance with WTO decisions, uh, proliferation of nuclear war. Uh, terrorist attacks in the Middle East, whatever the topics that you're interested in, and you set about trying to answer a question, right? And the methods that you use will depend on the question that exists. Uh, now, within international laws, um, Tom just highlighted um, a second ago, within international law, there were similarly these sort of uh, schools of thought and methods that were used. And these schools and methods um, uh, entailed along with them a host of associated assumptions about the way that actors work, the way that institutions work, uh, how people behave, what level of analysis that we should be doing, et cetera. And these um, sort of schools or assumptions that people signed off on were then influenced throughout their scholarship. Now, a trend that has emerged over the last 20 years uh, is a move within international law scholarship to move away from these sort of commitments and attachments where you're stuck um, within arguing within the, a, a single particular framework to move towards uh, regular social science. And so what we're describing in our essay, as I think we put it in the introduction, uh, we're not describing uh, a change that should take place or describing a, a new development. Instead, the, the social science approach that we're talking about uh, is one that's been being performed and done by leading scholars for at least 20 years, published in the most prominent journals, um, that has received uh, citations, recognitions, et cetera. Uh, however, one that is often not the way that people talk about methods uh, in international law and international legal scholarship. And what we're saying is that a perfectly sensible and reasonable way to approach these questions is just with a standard approach to social science. You think of a question, you think of a hypothesis, you think what evidence you would need to test your hypothesis. That evidence could be quantitative, that is you build a data set, you run an experiment, it could be case studies, it could be historical process tracing, whatever it may be. And then beyond that, you then try to think of, uh, test your hypothesis and clearly say what the limits of your evidence are, what you found, what your level of uncertainty is, et cetera. All right, we're saying that many of us already are and have been doing international legal scholarship in that way. And our hope is that we can um, uh, sort of formally get rid of uh, the old labels, not add new ones. And that if you want to break into international legal scholarship now, as many of the um, you know, CGL members that are here today, I, I hope do, that you shouldn't have to worry about whether or not you're a realist or institutionalist, et cetera, and instead set about figuring out the answers to important questions. Now, one note on this is that we are not by any means the first to point out this development. Um, and the point of our essay is in part to have this conversation, not to claim a new independent contribution. I'll just note two instances of this being highlighted before. The first is um, uh, Eric Posner and Jack Goldsmith, both um, at the time, roughly, I'll let them clarify this later, uh, but roughly at the time that they published their book on the limits of international law, they also published an essay called The New International Legal Scholarship, where they sort of, um, uh, explained exactly these kinds of ideas and said, like, it's great that we're moving to an international legal scholarship that's more empirical, less ideological, uh, more grounded in evidence, et cetera. Uh, I think to some extent that that methodological claim that Eric and Jack were making, uh, which I think is perfectly sensible and reasonable, got lost in some of the debate over the um, either uh, conclusions or normative uh, implications or something around the arguments in their book. And so the methods piece got lost. And so we're not necessarily saying much different than what their, um, their new international law essay said, although perhaps a few of the assumptions are slightly different. The second thing that I'd say is that um, 
uh, Greg Schaefer and Tom Ginsburg, both of whom are here today, uh, wrote an essay in the American Journal of International Law on the empirical turn of international law, I believe that was in 2012. I mean, uh, eight, 10 years ago when this essay first started circulating, at the time documenting I mean, hundreds of studies, dozens of studies. I mean, it's like 80 pages long listing all these different empirical work that had studied international law. The point being that this trend was well in place, this empirical turn, uh, you know, a decade ago, or at least uh, eight years ago at the time. Uh, we're just uh, trying to make the case that this is an approach that's sensible uh, and should continue not trying to make a new claim. The only thing that I would add, um, perhaps that is beyond what Tom, uh, uh, and Greg mentioned at the time, is that empirical can be more broadly defined when we discuss the social science approach beyond just uh, quantitative social science uh, and approaches to use qualitative or mixed method scientific approaches as well, uh, or even theoretical approaches within the broader social science tradition. And we're saying that's all under this broad umbrella. All right, I'll stop there and hand it over to Daniel to, to make the third point. Thank you, Adam and Tom, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, I think Tom and Adam have laid out very nicely what the claim is, how it fits along the broader developments within international law, and what the uh, contributions have been of others in trying to um, make these make this claim and, and, and develop it. We, we build on, on what they've done. I think it's also important to talk about the implications for the future. So how do we think about this claim and why is it relevant for thinking about international law scholarship going forward? So I think it's abundantly clear that social science approaches are more and more prevalent in international law scholarship, but they're not perfect. And we also say that rigor, caution, and skepticism should apply in considering research questions. It also should apply as we think about our own work and our own claims about the, the social science approach. One limitation that I think many people would recognize, but it's important to bring out, is that data is not self-creating. Someone has to collect the data, organize the data, clean the data, and make a number of judgments about the data in preparing the sort of scholarship and answering the research questions that they, they intend to, uh, to address. In doing so, clearly normative considerations come up. These normative considerations impact the initial choice of question. They also impact a lot of the judgments with respect to how we measure the data. And it's particularly important that we are aware of that. Not we as the three of us, we all of us as scholars who are thinking about social science and thinking about um, how we answer research questions. One advantage of the social science approach is there are ways to measure this and see how normative considerations may have an impact on how one picks data and thinks about research questions. And we want to be open about that limitation and also encourage people to think about that as they think about their scholarship. Second, social science research requires a collection of data, and the data sometimes is dated. Uh, it's not necessarily attuned ide ideally to a rapidly changing world. We mentioned this in, in the essay, but it's important to, to emphasize this, that we're looking backwards to figure out what we have been doing recently, as recently as possible, to then understand perhaps what we can and should do um, in the future. So there, those are two limitations. There are others, but those are two major things to think about when you think about social science approaches. But overall, the trajectory is very, very positive. And when I say it's very positive, you can think of all the developments since the initial work that uh, from Eric and others to Tom and Greg uh, uh, Schaefer now, the quality of the data is much better. The amount of data is greater. The collection and maintenance of data is of higher quality. Access is much more than the small groups database are available. You can access it also more rapidly. We've developed over the last 25 years better and more sophisticated methods to understand the data. And as we know in, in uh, transparency is critical, scholars are now presenting their research questions initially, talking about the hypotheses that, they, that they're trying to test for and making all the data sets available well before going into any sort of publication phase. This only strengthens the quality of the social science of approach and the, the quality of the answers to the questions that uh, scholars produce. Moreover, social science approaches are pluralistic, and that's important. Observational data, text analysis, survey experiments, field experiments, qualitative field research. These are, it's a big tent, as was described earlier, and it's a big tent within social science approaches. And frankly, international law scholarship should be pluralistic as well, and it is whether it's empirical, whether it's normative, whether it's theoretical, doctrinal, all of that is good. And it's unusual, I think, for at least the three of us to think that 
we would not want to have a big tent conception, not only within the social science approaches, but with all approaches to try to answer questions internationally. Finally, it, it's, it's interesting to think about why there may be questions about social science approaches to international law when we see the enormous benefits of methodological pluralism and legal scholarship more generally. I'll just pick one area. Think about criminal justice. Think about the empirical research that's gone into thinking about legal outcomes, whether it's judicial behavior, police behavior, the operation of the criminal justice system, racial inequities. Think about the doctrinal work that's gone into thinking about these questions. Think about the normative work about what the structure should be. All of those are the sorts of things we think about when we think about methodological pluralism, bringing a social science approach to answer hugely important questions. The same thing can happen in international law. It has been. I think it's likely it's likely to continue. Uh, so with that, I think uh, the three of us are finished with our, our presentations. We're happy to open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate that presentation. Next up is uh, Professor Matthew Geary, who is an Associate Professor of Modern Chinese Studies, an Associate Research Fellow of the Sociolegal Studies Center at the University of Oxford. His presentation is titled China and Comparative International Law Between Social Science and Critique. Professor Yuri. Thank you very much, Jared, and, and, and thank you all for having me. It's really a privilege to be part of this conversation. Uh, I'm going to actually share some visuals. So I was asked to read uh, Chilton et al.'s stimulating article from the perspective of China. Uh, why China? Well, for one, the size of the economy. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought forward the timeline a uh, timeline for which China will surpass the US as the world's largest economy now by 2028. Two, uh, many Chinese legal scholars argue that China is rising into a world system whose rules are not of China's making. So the question is, what does China do with this? Does it remain a status quo power? Does it assume the position of a revisionist power? Does it create its own parallel or alternative system? So these are very live questions. It behooves us to understand the hows and whys of China's engagement in international law and greater attention to Chinese legal scholars' work can help us with this. So my move here is to bring Chilton et al.'s article into conversation with the literature on comparative international law, uh, mainly that by Anthea Roberts and several others, to ask whether there is a comparative approach uh, that is a social scientific one that uh, Chinese scholars have applied to the study of international law within China. So I'd like to begin with a couple of images. Uh, on the top left, you have Xi Jinping making a visit to the China University of Political Science and Law uh, in 2017, during the 65th anniversary of the founding of the law school there, um, shaking hands with the very senior members of the esteemed law faculty. In the lower left, Xi Jinping is giving a lecture on rule of law to the law students. Uh, and in this lecture, he mentions that actually he he uh, advises the law students to contribute to what he calls global rule of law, or shi jie fa zhi. So this is an example of the political regime entering the law uh, academy. On the right-hand side, you have an excerpt from an essay written by Huang Jin, who's a very uh, senior scholar of private international law, also at CUPL. Uh, and in this essay, he argues that international law in China should be elevated to what he calls a first level academic discipline. So in China, in the academy, there's various levels of the disciplines. And right now, only law, general law, has a first level status. And he argues that international law should also attain this status. Um, I should also mention that Huang Jin is a major advocate of Xi Jinping thought as applied to international law. And so what you see here is a kind of picture of mutual access, kind of symbiotic relationship between the political regime, the party state, and the legal academy. And I would argue that these conditions are different from the conditions that have given rise to the social scientific approach to international law in the English language literature. So these questions are of high relevance to me. I'm very fortunate to be the principal investigator in a five-year project called China Law and Development, which is looking at how China is shaping international law and the legal and regulatory systems of host states that receive uh, Chinese capital. Uh, as a legal anthropologist, I'm very much devoted to conversations between law and the social sciences, uh, and also conversations between the Anglophone and the Sinophone uh, spheres of in influence, if you will. Um, to foreshadow the findings of, of my essay, there are institutional, pedagogic, and ultimately political reasons uh, 
that, that leave very little room for uh, the social scientific approach to international law in China. Um, but really what we see is the growth of critical approaches to international law, okay? Something that Chilton et al. discuss in their paper. And in China, as I mentioned, this has to do with the synergy uh, between the legal, legal academy and the party state. So in preview, I'm going to be tracking the general structure of their paper, providing a very quick thumbnail uh, history, then go into some of the real world problems of international law for Chinese scholars, and then talk about trends in the academy. Um, so I provide an account for the embryonic nature of social scientific approaches to international law in China, as well as the flourishing aspects of the critical literature uh, through a kind of sociolo sociology of knowledge. That is, why do some schools of thought or approaches uh, attain attraction, whereas others do not in the Chinese ecosystem? And then lastly, diagnose some of the key contributions of this emergent field. So Chilton et al. start with Oppenheim's 1908 article, The Science of International Law. At that time, uh, China was very much in political and economic uh, decline, right? So this is a painting of the 1911 Xinhai uh, Rebellion uh, that ultimately resulted in the end of the, the Qing Empire. Um, so comparatively speaking, that was the condition of China at, at the time. Despite this political and economic collapse, this was ironically uh, the genesis for the study of international law in China. And that had to do with this gentleman, uh, Shen Jiaban, or Grand Shen, as he's called, who was the head of the Bureau of the Revision of Qing Law. And his task was a massive one. Uh, he was tasked with modernizing the legal system. So he wrote a number of uh, drafts of foundational laws, the criminal law of 1909, the civil procedure law of 1910, many others. And it was at this time that fundamental notions of sovereignty constitutionalism and international law entered the Chinese lexicon. Now, I should note that uh, Grand Shen did not advocate science as the approach to international law, but rather uh, classical Chinese textual analysis called Kao Ju. All right, so you can see this kind of difference uh, in method from the outset. So fast forwarding in time, um, in the 1970s, China joins the UN 1971, China began signing bilateral investment treaties with a number of countries joins the WTO in 2001, and in recent years has been creating its own international financial and legal institutions. So Chinese uh, approaches to international law and the scholarship have come a long way. So now I'm going to shift into a discussion of the practical needs and then move into the trends in the academy. So there's a number of real world problems, uh, certainly that Beijing is dealing with in regards to uh, its approach to international law. And there's a strong argument that the scholarship on international law in China must be useful. It must be practical. If so, there is access to data. If so, there is funding for this research. Okay, so I'll give you three examples. There are others. The three examples, number one, maritime disputes. We can think of, for example, the South China Seas arbitration in 2016, China versus the Philippines generated a huge amount of scholarship, some of it empirical. Uh, secondly, enforcement of foreign arbitral awards, which is uh, a very hot topic in China, has also generated a huge volume of scholarship. And number three is uh, Chinese conceptions of human rights. And here I, I have an image, the emblem of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences uh, Institute of International Law, which is a fascinating institution. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into it. So the point is that China has its own practical needs. Uh, some of these are reactive, uh, thinking about, for example, the territorial disputes. Some of these are very proactive in terms of, for example, developing uh, capacity to onshore international or cross-border commercial disputes. Moving on to trends in the academy, uh, at the general level, very general here, um, there is an oscillation between two poles of thought. The first is Marxist legal theory. Uh, starting in the 1950s, where it was rather extreme over time, it's become more nuanced. But really, this was perceived at the time as a scientific approach to law, including international law. Um, this could be called Law and Economics 1, or Generation 1 in China, and it equated law with politics, certainly. In the 1980s, China law professors started pushing back on Marxism and introduced ideas of civil law doctrinalism through European and Japanese counterparts. Um, you know, think about, for example, John Henry Merriman's idea of legal science, 
uh, Chinese scholars were looking to Kelsen's pure theory of law, and this kind of excluded politics. It was all about the legal rules. Um, since 2013 and Xi Jinping's uh, assumption of uh, power, Marxism is back in a big way. We have uh, scholars, for example, uh, Jiang Shigong, who have written about Chinese constitutionalism. There's the rise of the new left. Uh, politics is, is very relevant yet once again. Now, the, the point of all this is to say that between these oscillating poles, they leave very little room for social scientific approaches, okay? Um, now, what's interesting is that in terms of the study of domestic law in China, there is uh, a budding, if not robust literature that uses social scientific approaches, legal sociology, uh, law and economics, uh, legal anthropology, etc. I've just listed a few of the scholars here. There are academic journals that uh, encourage this approach. There are uh, Chinese sociolegal study centers. There are WeChat groups that are quite active in, in creating virtual communities to discuss these issues. So you see real institutional support for these. However, when it comes to international law, there is much less traction for social scientific approaches uh, outside of those practical issues that I flagged earlier. So I've just listed some of the different schools of, of thought that have already been mentioned by our, our esteemed uh, colleagues. And, and what we see is oftentimes they are transplanted into China through what can be called the pioneer, somebody who studied uh, outside of China. For example, Zhu Su Li studied at Arizona State University in the late 1980s. Wang Guiguo was the first Chinese uh, to uh, obtain a JSD from Yale in 1984, student of Michael Reisman. They brought these ideas back, but some have flourished and, and others certainly have not. It seems the criterion is the extent to which the scholars have aligned that scholarship with the developmental aims of the Chinese party state. So the problem really seems to be kind of double firewalls uh, between the Anglophone scholarship and Chinese scholarship on the one hand, but also between the domestic law scholars and international law scholars on the other hand. Um, some Chinese may go abroad to obtain a PhD in economics, political science, sociology, anthropology. There may be an opportunity cost in doing that, however. The job market may not value those degrees. And the publication system may also not reward the years it takes to collect, compile, and analyze data in a rigorous empirical fashion. Uh, there's an interesting question about writing outside of the Chinese uh, uh, journal system, for example, writing in English language journals. We can talk about that in the Q&A if people are interested. At the same time, what we do see is a flourishing of critical approaches to international law. Now, these are not necessarily empirical. Um, oftentimes, they're based on certain arguments of Chinese culture. There's culturalist assumptions, this idea that because China has a different historical cultural background, that it uh, offers uh, new approaches to thinking about international law, particularly for developing countries. I just listed a few of the scholars and individuals here. Although their approaches differ, they share views that aspects of international law are indeed hegemonic. Western states created the rules. It's now China's turn to rewrite the rules in its own image. In terms of where we're going with this, well, uh, certainly, there is increased focus on a number of areas uh, by Beijing in terms of the field of international law. I've listed a few of those here. Uh, in terms of the approaches that scholars will take to analyze these problems, social scientific approaches are slowly growing. Uh, there's a second generation of young scholars who are going abroad, despite the problems that I mentioned earlier, and they are coming back to China and creating uh, epistemic communities to engage on these issues. And ultimately, they are taking the form of uh, a new a group of bilingual scholars who are writing both in English and Chinese. Uh, they're working with international academic organizations that span multiple jurisdictions and cultural divides to open up new spaces for transnational scholarly communities. I'll end on that note. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Professor Geary. Um, now, uh, for our final presentation, uh, we have Professor James Tuogati. Uh, Professor Gatti is the Wing Tat Lee Chair in International Law and Professor of Law at Loyola University Chicago School of Law. His presentation is titled, Studying Race and in International Law Scholarship Using a Social Science Approach. Professor Gatti. Uh, 
So thank you uh, very much, uh, Jared and, and Nima and uh, everybody at the, at the journal for this kind of invitation, as well as to um, uh, uh, the paper that was just presented by uh, Ginsburg, by Chilton and uh, Daniel Abebe. Um, so I will be uh, sharing a slide or two uh, shortly. Uh, and I wanted to say that the specific research question that I want to uh, answer in my essay uh, is the extent to which scholarship has addressed international laws, historical and continuing complicity in pr producing racial equality and hierarchy, including slavery, as well as subjugation and domination of the peoples of the First Nations and the Third World. Uh, I know that Professor Ginsberg mentioned that I would be talking about uh, uh, sort of my 12 work. Uh, here I'm focusing particularly on, on race, why race has been left out uh, in a lot of the scholarship on international law. Uh, to answer that question, uh, I looked at the content uh, of uh, the American Journal of International Law since it was first published uh, in 1907 to, 2000, to 2020. Uh, as well as its online companion that has been published, AGL Unbound, that's been published from uh, 2014 to 2020. Uh, I, I think that uh, Tom and Daniel and, uh, and uh, Adam will be happy to note that I followed your uh, method to a T, uh, uh, even though I am very skeptical about the, the way that you sort of uh, separate the normative uh, sort of questions from what you call the positive inquiry, as I will be uh, suggesting uh, uh, as in my 10 minute or so presentation. Uh, I will be posting my paper on SSRN maybe by the end of the day so that people can see the methodology. Uh, but I wanna share with you the, the, the results. Uh, uh, the results are pretty, uh, unfortunately I can share that uh, with you for some reason. Uh, but the results uh, from this uh, inquiry were really stuck uh, in the sense that uh, of 7,475 documents in the American Journal of International Law, uh, only 143 uh, over more than 100 years or 1.19% incorporate the word race. Of those 143 documents, 91 of them or 1.22%, uh, use race in a boilerplate sort of statutory general uh, list embedded context, meaning they're not really talking about race in the context that I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, very shortly. Um, and in brief, only 24 or 0.32% of the 7,475 documents substantially engage with race in the body of their text. Uh, and only three or 0.04% of the 7,475 documents had race in their title. Uh, the situation is not any better with AJL Unbound, and I'm sorry, I can't share with you uh, my, my three slides. Uh, um, uh, in AJL Unbound, only three of uh, 541 articles or 0.55% uh, uh, used race uh, in uh, the body of the text. And none of them, uh, based on my analysis, uh, substantially engaged with race in the body of their text or in their title. So what explains uh, this extremely low engagement uh, with race as a theme in the American Journal of International Law and its online companion? My hypothesis or my assumption, sorry, is that it's implausible and factually inaccurate to explain this silence as indicative of the relevance of race in international law. And uh, as I said, I'll explain what, uh, what I mean when I use the term race. I'm using race to refer to relations of domination, uh, not uh, questions of personal prejudice. International law has since at least the 16th century when Francisco de Vitoria wrote his treatises, justified slavery, conquest, colonialism, commerce and other forms of domination of non-European uh, peoples. Race was and continues to be a salient analytic category in international law. As Anthony Yangi argues, uh, understanding the role of race and culture in the formation of basic international law doctrines, such as sovereignty, is crucial to understanding uh, 
the singular relationship between sovereignty and the non-European world. In addition to use the example of black intellectuals, there's a strong black internationalist tradition uh, that hasn't featured in the pages of the leading journal in the United States on international law. This intellectual tradition associated with anti-slavery and anti-colonialism runs from W.E. Du Bois, uh, who argued the problem of the 20th century was a color line to contemporary colleagues like Ruth Gordon, Henry Richardson III, Adrian Wing, uh, to name a few. They also include other international, black international lawyers who I have discovered, like uh, this guy, Y. N. Cly, who's really done this fabulous work on international law and the black minority in the United States. Uh, and so you have to really look for these people because you're not going to find them in the pages of the leading journal in the United States. Um, so I have four hypotheses uh, to account for uh, the fact that uh, the leading journal of international law in the United States, and it also prides itself uh, in the world. And I sit on that journal, so maybe I'm very complicit uh, in not tracing uh, sort of international laws, historical and continuing complicity in producing racial inequality, hierarchy, slavery, the subjugation uh, and domination of the peoples of the First Nations in the leading journal. So my first hypothesis is that the, there's been a conscious exclusion of African Americans uh, until recently in uh, the American Society of International Law. And in fact, a 2020 report known as the Richardson Report adopted by the American Society of International Law at its annual meeting um, a couple of years ago, uh, and this is the society under whose umbrella the American Journal of International Law falls. Uh, it's the flagship journal of this society. I uh, noted that during the first, and I quote, during the first decades, first six decades uh, of the existence and growth of the society, minority membership or participation was silently and effectively excluded, uh, excluded domestic persons of color based on their ethnicity, culture, uh, religion, or sexual orientation. This finding is consistent, consistent with evidence in other areas of scholarship, not just international law, where scholars have argued that decisions to restrict minorities by college chancellors and presidents have shaped the current moment in higher education. Um, so in, in their paper, Chilton, Ginsberg, and Abebe quote a letter to the American Journal of International Law in 1999, noting that the agora they mentioned uh, excluded uh, perspectives of the concerns of people of color. Further, uh, we know it was not until 2014, almost to 108 years since the American Journal was first published, that African Americans were first elected to sit on the board of editors. We can infer from this history of exclusion uh, of what the report, the Richardson report calls the silent and effective exclusion of domestic persons of color, that it's not surprising that the American Journal of International Law has not focused extensively uh, on tracing the relevance of race in international law. The second hypothesis, tough scrutiny of scholarship relating to race. A 1945 review in the journal uh, of W.E.B. E. Du Bois's 1945 book, uh, color and democracy, colonies and peace, perhaps sums up the type of skeptical scrutiny about scholarship relating to race that uh, has uh, for many decades in my view, uh, that I can infer sort of resides in the journal. Wrote PMW, PM Brown of the board of editors, um, and I quote, the hideous cruelties of abominable humiliations and incredible injustices suffered by, color, by the colored race have created bitterness that precludes an objective and fair analysis of the whole colonial problem. The author has not provided a dispassionate and realistic solution. I'm still reading the quote. The author seems to lack realism in considering the status of many African tribes so obviously unprepared for united political action, self-government and independence. I'm still reading the quote. He does not credit the colonial powers with sincerity in acknowledging their responsibilities as trustees for the education of backward peoples for full freedom and international obligations. This is 1945. These words speak for themselves. They strongly suggest to me that uncovering sensitive issues of race will only sow division and, that they, sh and they constitute pure grievance. They seem to suggest that it's not possible to speak about race and racism objectively. 
in fact, uh, I would say, I mean, this is not the argument that is made in the paper that uh, Shilton Ginsburg and Abeba make, uh, but uh, they, in several places, uh, dismissively refer to the work of scholars who do critical work, especially work relating to race. And I'm not suggesting there's a relationship here, but there's a critical scrutiny of work relating to race that I track both based on my own personal experience, but also based on the types of reviews, like the review in 1945 that I have referred to. All this suggests that perhaps, therefore, the proper way to research and write about international law is devoid of any emotion. Even more, the reviewer of the Du Bois book holds the view that colored peoples of the colony are backward, itself a racist notion. That sounds, I mean, and that Du Bois failed to give credit to the colonial powers for all they were doing. That sounds like an apology for colonialism. This is emotional. It's not objective. This has got nothing to do with being objective. I'm sorry. I may be accused of an anachronism here, another critique that I'm using my standards of the 21st century to judge a review written in 1945, uh, where, um, you know, maybe those views were acceptable um, uh, and that transposing my 21st century sensibilities is, is inaccurate. Uh, but I say two things. First, 1945 was at the height of anti-colonial and anti-racist uh, efforts against colonial rule in most of Asia and Africa. Uh, um, and second, uh, W.B. Du Bois was one of the leading African-American intellectuals of his time, connecting white domination of African-Americans in the United States to what he called the global color line. Uh, so clearly the question of race and racial injustice were really at the center of the discussion in the debate in the United States and abroad. Um, the fact that not much progress to date has been made in publishing scholarship that centers examination of the relationship between international law and race seems to have followed the historical tra trajectory or path dependency of no consistent practice of publishing such work. Um, and I, I can say more about that, but I'll go to my third hypothesis. Uh, the big or defining debates about international law in the United States have focused on other issues than race. The defining debates about international law in the United States, in particular, as represented in the American Journal of International Law, have not simply focused or zeroed in on the role or place of race in international law. Uh, a lot of the debates uh, um, uh, have focused on, like for example, the big culture wars uh, between the relationship uh, of US law and international law, between the modern or the revis revisionist position, or uh, as we had uh, in the presentation uh, by, by Tom and, and, and uh, Daniel and uh, Adam, uh, you know, this fight uh, among scholars about the proper method, you know, whether it's the social science approach or some other approach, uh, uh, take your pick, uh, or the role of the United States in the world, especially when there is uh, a use of force or questions about rendition or torture or national security or humanitarian intervention, those attract a lot of attention. Uh, or the relationship between the United States and international institutions like the United Nations and the International Criminal Court, those attract a lot of attention. On sort of the international economic law front, the extraterritorial scope of the U.S.'s prescriptive, prescriptive jurisdiction, those attract a lot of attention. Or the black letter questions of international law that characterize the work of the Office of Legal Counsel of the U.S. Department of Justice, those are the types of questions that you see most frequently published on in the pages of the American Journal of International Law. And the last hypothesis that I have is the color blindness as the default rule in uh, a lot of the uh, work uh, published in the American Journal of International Law. And here, this is just simply to say that uh, all these questions, which I certainly care about, and I'm not suggesting that it does not care about, uh, cannot really be seen because the default position is uh, is, uh, is color blindness. As I've noted elsewhere recently, US domestic law, citing my friends, the critical race theorists, was constructed on assumptions that white identity embodied the ideal expression of humanity in terms of morality, progress, and civilization. Likewise, imperial international law was constructed on the basis of white racial superiority as rational stewards of the territories of non European peoples. Uh, these uh, sort of racist myths of uh, of indigenous savagery and primitivism and pathology were the basis upon which a lot of uh, international law in the past uh, with resonances today continue to be based in my view. Uh, and, and 
unfortunately, uh, the non-engagement with these issues uh, in the pages of the American Journal of International Law over 100 years suggests to me the default position adopted by the journal is that of color blindness, and that much, much more work here needs to be done. So to conclude, uh, I, I am very skeptical about the Chilton, Ginsburg, and Abebe social science approach, uh, even though it's the approach that I have used when they say, uh, when they sort of uh, uh, um, uh, make this distinction between uh, sort of positive inquiry that is non-normative and normative approaches uh, that talk about issues like the one that I am talking about today. And to the extent to which over 100 years in the American Journal of International Law, the choice seems not to have, the choice was made not to publish uh, really on questions about race. To the extent to which that was excluded, um, that represents uh, a, a choice, uh, not just in the subject matter, but a choice that uh, is, in my view, one that cannot really be said to be sort of an objective, non-normative choice. Uh, and so um, I think that one of the limitations of which is the claim, uh, I think that uh, they make uh, around questions that surround the sort of policing the boundaries of what is neutral and, and, and what is not. So thank you very much for the opportunity again. Thank you very much, Professor Gatti. Um, we will now move into uh, the Q&A period. And I will be taking questions from the audience. So if you're part of the audience, please feel free to send your questions to me, Jared Mayer, via the chat. Um, I also, if you are a panelist, i.e. either on this panel or in future panels, please feel free to unmute yourself um, and uh, sort of jump into the conversation. Yeah, Mr. Ginsburg. Just to, while we wait for uh, folks to populate the question thing, I thought that was a wonderful pair of presentations by uh, James and Matt. And um, I think James has challenged us in a way, uh, something we didn't really say much about, which is how do you formulate hypotheses? And it, he's just provided a great example of you know, sort of the method we use, but he's using sort of critical race theory, or you know, I want to put a label on it, using sort of uh, um, an understanding of race to formulate the question. And we don't say anything in our paper about how you formulate questions. And he's clearly right that that has to come from somewhere. It's not just, uh, the questions are not just out there magically waiting to appear. And that's where uh, some reflexivity, I think, is really important. So I just wanted to sort of say that, um, and also to point out that we're certainly not defending the, the, the American Journal and its approach, but that maybe um, combining these things as you just have is, is, a, is an important way forward. Jared, is it okay if I ask a question of the, the three authors? Please. So I'd like to kind of crystallize my presentation and in, in, into the form of a question to, to present to, to the three of you. So the, the question is, is how international are social scientific approaches to international law? Okay, I'm, your article is not doing the work of a, of a literature review necessarily, but I'm curious in your research on this question, did you find that there are parallel conversations beyond the kind of, you know, uh, Euro-American core scholarship? Uh, what's happening in Japan? What's happening in Brazil and in Russia and in South Africa and the other emerging economies? Do you see similar approaches and, and what are the parallels that can be drawn? Thanks. I mean, I think that the answer is not very, not very international. Using that uh, comparative international law approach, if you that into. That project basically showed that international law isn't very comparative. <laughs> uh, it isn't very, you know, they're, they're that still predominantly, you know, Euro-American. And even our approach is much more American than Europe's. And that's because of developments in the American Academy more broadly. Um, and so that's, that's, I suppose, another critique of it. Um, though, yeah, maybe that's all I'll say. I would say that, um, so I think of my, my own research as this sort of Venn diagram of um, empirical research and international research, and most of it sort of fitting in the middle of that Venn diagram. And I've taught classes both at our own law school, and we have summer schools for legal scholars from around the world and other places on empirical methods for international scholarship. Uh, and I 
I think most people are from other countries when I meet legal scholars from many places are surprised that these two things can go together um, or unfamiliar with the um, with the concept of it. And so I think the empirical legal studies and the law and economics movements that exist in, uh, in other countries that international law has not yet been a big part of that. Of course, there's exceptions and um, uh, and counter examples, but I do think that um, it's an area where the scholars doing empirical research on international law and social scientific research on international law are going to be um, probably disproportionately from the United States. So Daniel, you want to get in on this? Yeah, I just wanted to add very quickly. Um, I did some work on uh, African courts and in particular human rights cases. Uh, in engaging the literature, the vast majority of the authors were uh, African authors from various countries. And the amount who were thinking about it empirically was fairly small. And I think it's consistent with what we're describing. Though I think there was a recognition that this tool would be useful to understand the functioning of the various courts uh, in existence in Africa. In the same way, there's some discussion of that with respect to a, a, another project in thinking about Ethiopia and Egypt and the, the division of the Nile and thinking about water use and things like that, which naturally start to engage questions that require some empirical orientation. But I think the general approach is, is, is description is right, that that's not the dominant way of, of, uh, of thinking about things, certainly um, at least in those areas of literature that I've become more familiar with. Uh, Professor Akin Kogri, I think you, you said you wanted to jump in on this, and then afterwards we'll move on to Professor Schaefer. Yeah, so thanks, uh, Matthew, for, for that question. Uh, I just sort of think that in that question, it's an assumption in itself that um, that understandings of the of the generation of international legal knowledge, right? In, for example, African continent, African states is is accepted, right? Uh, the basis of comparison is that there's something you want to compare. Uh, yet we are in an era where, as James C. Grosher's lecture last year shows, uh, we're still saying, and as Daniel really says, oh, acknowledge this production of knowledge in these parts of the world, right? And so th these are the complexities, and I think it's the value of this approach, and inherent is that as a careful nuance and a care call uh, to say that uh, the levels at which the societies all exist right now uh, is still not at, at the same point. Uh, and just, just the point I thought to put out there, right, about, about an assumption in that. Uh, Professor Schaefer, please. Sure. So first of all, just thanks all. This is a great uh, paper and great bringing uh, everybody together. So two questions, one for the authors of the main paper um, and then one from Matthew. Um, and so I was just wondering what your perception, this was taught, you know, touched on by James um, in particular and Matthew, but the relationship between power and knowledge um, you know, it's what you sort of used to be a really, you know, distinction, and at least in your framework essay, the way I read it, is that somehow knowledge is, you know, out, you know, not affected by power, and it'd just be interesting, one, I mean, Tom, you mentioned sort of relax, reflect the positioning of, you know, how you, the framework you use, what questions you ask, um, that seems really important, um, which probably also reflects which articles appear and which articles don't appear, and then it just be do an empirical study and since James did this, but you know, what empirical studies are picked up, right, by actors in the world and what empirical studies are alighted, ignored, and so forth, um, in the sense that knowledge is the knowledge created by empirical studies happens within a context, but also it interacts with the world, um, which picks them up or not. And the second is just with Matthew. I mean, that was really fascinating. I was wondering if you could say a bit more in terms of the use of empirics in the Chinese Legal Academy, um, is it used or you, uh, mainly instrumentally? Um, do you see real debates where empirics, you know, where people disagree and where empirics are used to inform mm -hmm. positions or, you know, and, and sort of relatedly, um, I mean, there's a Chinese diaspora of uh, out, working outside China. Do you see much Sort of a, a, a binary, a distinction, or a much exchange or a differentiation between so the use of more social science methods or in, or relative freedom or or so forth. Um, so anyway, a really great study. I look forward to reading it. Um, I guess we can sort of respond and turn to Professor Schaefer's question. So whoever wants to respond to the first question, please feel free. Uh, 
it's somewhat orthogonal, but you know, these are, these are, and the comparative international law project, which Matt was engaged in and referred to is itself an empirical project, right? It says, we're gonna go and look at this phenomenon out there all around the world. And I think what's so nice about Matt, and he and I've had debates about the role of anthropology, but I think he's uh, demonstrated here some of the utility, which is sort of decolonizing a little bit what we think about uh, the category is and just sort of taking it on its own terms as if it, uh, for its own purposes. And that's certainly true of a country as big and complex as China, that that's gonna have to be how you approach it. My view of that is quite consistent with the social science approach. You're trying to understand what is, and you're picking a method that um, requires you to do something pretty hard. Um, but I don't see that as at all um, uh, incompatible. I think that that was my, what I heard BC saying as well. So yeah, I don't, I didn't want to cut off any of the other uh, scholars. Uh, Greg, thank you for your questions. Um, and I really like your framing of power knowledge. I think that's really critical. So thanks for um, bringing us back to that. In terms of the debates on empirical legal studies in, in China, um, certainly there is a, a strain that is uh, instrumentalist, if not normative. And I, I guess I would also take issue with the distinction between social science in one camp and normativity in the other. Sometimes social scientists can be used um, as handmaiden for the normative, right? And particularly in context without academic freedom and so on and so forth. So for example, uh, you know, again, there's, there's a range and it's hard to uh, give you a, a kind of general assessment because there's so much diversity in terms of what's happening. But uh, I think of, for example, a recent book on UNCLOS um, arbitration written by uh, Gao Jun in 2020. This is in response to the 2016 South China Sea arbitration. And in this book, uh, it's a very uh, incredibly detailed empirical study of the procedural rules of various uh, arbitration tri tribunals under uh, Article 7 of UNCLOS. The, 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 the underlying aim, however, seems to be to provide a model set of procedural rules that ultimately would be kind of beneficial to the, um, the interests of, of Beijing, right? So, so there is subtlety, there's nuance, but there's also, as you suggested, a kind of instrumentalism, and that seems to be an ongoing sort of direction. But that's not to say that all of the empirical scholarship does this, right? I think of, for example, uh, He Qisheng wrote a fantastic article in 2014 on the enforcement of foreign judgments. And in that article, he examines how courts use public policy to basically uh, not recognize uh, foreign arbitral uh, agreements and awards. And um, there is a kind of nudging that that piece does to get judges to think about uh, public policy in new ways. So it's not all totally in service to power, right? There are spaces to take a step back and look at so-called best practice internationally or look at comparative jurisdictions and then also to try to bring that back to China's ongoing legal reform, right? So scholars can push. They're not just, you know, again, sort of following the dictates of, of the party state. As you said, there is a huge diaspora. So we do see different types of conversations happening in Hong Kong, in Singapore, Chinese scholars in the US and Europe and elsewhere. Uh, you know, Hong Kong has a very robust empirical legal studies uh, uh, center, really. Um, I think there's a lot of the, uh, the best work is being done in Hong Kong. So th there does seem to be more uh, freedom to engage in these issues, access to data, and also to introduce a greater amount of leverage and critique when you're outside of, of the territorial jurisdiction. Thanks. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, we'll just take one more question. Uh, Professor Posner, do you still have a question back to share? Or? Uh, sure. Very quickly, I just you know listening to uh, Matt, Matt talk about China, it reminded me a lot of the United States, because there's a similar um, uh, division between the domestic law people and the international law people, with the domestic law people doing empirical and theoretical work much earlier. And so here's a hypothesis uh, that the international law people in the U.S. are much more closely tied up with the government uh, or with uh, international organizations that they want to be invited onto. Or, um, and the problem with doing social science work is that you, you know, you're, always, always, you're almost always going to offend someone because you know, the facts don't always support people's views. Whereas if you don't do social science work and you just you know, make philosophical or normative arguments, it's much easier to mold that to uh, the mainstream views of international organizations or government uh, agencies that you might want to uh, join. 
Um, so that, I mean, I, it sounds so. It just sounds to me like in China, you know, the government cares a lot more about what the international law scholars are saying than what the domestic law scholars are saying, and so you know, people are behaving like rational actors. That was not a question. That was a comment. <laughs> but you're free to respond if you want. Thank you, Professor Posner, for that. I would say the dynamics in China are not necessarily exclusive uh, to, to China. And, and thank you for drawing attention to uh, potentially parallel dynamics in, in the US. Um, yeah, I would agree at a, at a general level that um, you know the Chinese government is particularly concerned about what uh, Chinese scholars who work on international law issues are writing, what they're publishing, um, you know, given that these are inherently cross-border uh, issues, right? And so concerns about audience reception and is that, um, is that sort of default, uh, you know, perspective being adopted by these scholars or not? So I, I think there, there is a rationality. I wouldn't contest uh, that general observation. And, and again, I, I do appreciate the uh, comparison to the U.S. and that's something for, for me to reflect on more as I revise my, my essay. So thanks. Wonderful. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you to all our panelists, Professors Ababa, Ginsburg, Chilton, Erie, and Gatti uh, for a really excellent conversation. And thank you to all, all those who have chimed in as well.